Chapter 1. Crisis in Little Rock The crowd erupted angrily when 15-year-old Elizabeth Eckford neared Little Rock Central High School. Television equipment recorded their jeering. Two, four, six, eight, we don't want to integrate. Elizabeth squeezed her books against her freshly ironed shirtwaist dress and walked toward the school door. Sunglasses hid the fear in her eyes as she looked around. Where are the others? she wondered. Nine African-American teenagers who would forever be known as the Little Rock Nine were supposed to arrive at the all-white high school on September 4th, 1957 and make history together. From the students who had applied, school officials had handpicked nine teenagers to become the school's first African-American students. But at that moment, Elizabeth was all alone. A mob of angry white people, several hundred in all, followed her to the entrance to the high school. Go back where you came from, a woman shouted at her. Elizabeth had felt a moment of hope when she noticed soldiers with rifles near the school's entrance. She guessed that the soldier's job was to make sure she and the eight other students entered the school safely. Elizabeth guessed wrong. As she approached the door, the soldiers, who were in the Arkansas National Guard, crossed their rifles and blocked her path. On the orders of Arkansas Governor Orville Faubus, they wouldn't allow her to enter the building. Her legs started shaking. The crowd continued to yell, Go home! Whites have rights too! She looked for a calm adult, someone who would make her feel safe. She noticed a woman with a kind face but the woman lunged forward and spit on her. Elizabeth held back tears. She didn't know what to do. Photographers and reporters circled her and the crowd, recording every movement. Elizabeth spun around and started walking wordlessly back toward the street. A white teenager, Hazel Bryan, walked behind her. Hazel normally had a bright smile to match her perky brown curls, but at that moment, her face twisted with rage. Go home, she screamed. Go back to Africa. Photographer Will Counts of the local newspaper, the Arkansas Democrat, snapped a photo and sealed the image in American history. Elizabeth, hoping to get the same education that her white peers were getting, and Hazel, determined to keep her from getting it. Count's photo and others from the Little Rock conflict revealed a divided nation. The Civil War had ended nearly 100 years earlier, but the country's hostilities clearly had not disappeared. Unable to get into school, Elizabeth sat on a bench at a bus stop. The crowd followed with name-calling and threats. Somebody urged the others to drag Elizabeth to a tree and hang her. It's one of these almost incredible things to see normal people, many of them, most of them, churchgoers, and if you'd get them in their homes, they would be the kindest, nicest people, said Benjamin Fine, a New York newspaper reporter who had been sent to Little Rock to cover the story. But in a mob group, something happens when that group gets together. Three reporters formed a protective ring around Elizabeth to keep the crowd from getting close. She sat motionless on the bench, waiting for a bus to take her away. Fine, of the New York Times, slid next to Elizabeth and put his arm around her. People in the crowd were shocked. White men in the South simply did not behave this way. Fine's action most likely made him a target for the mob during his stay in Little Rock. Individually, they would be nice to me, but in the group they would be ready if they could to tear me limb from limb. Many times they would just come up and bang me in the back or trip me or step on my foot or do all kinds of annoyances. By the end of the day, I was black and blue, he said. Fine comforted Elizabeth. Don't let them see you cry, he told her. Another reporter peppered Elizabeth with questions. Can you tell me your name, please? Are you going to school here at Central High? You don't care to say anything, is that right? Elizabeth 
didn't answer. Grace Lorch, a white woman who was a longtime civil rights supporter, came to Elizabeth's aid. She's just a little girl, she scolded the crowd. The woman boarded the bus with Elizabeth and helped calm the terrified teenager. By the time Elizabeth had reached the bus stop, the eight other African-American students had also been turned away from the school by soldiers. The parents of the eight students had received phone calls the night before with instructions from Daisy Bates, president of the Arkansas chapter of the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, or NAACP. They were to meet the next morning, and a handful of ministers, both black and white, would walk with the students to school to help them feel safe. The ministers also would serve to remind the hostile crowd of the importance of tolerance. Elizabeth's family never got a phone call explaining the plan for the Little Rock Nine. They didn't have a telephone. Elizabeth had boarded the bus and later faced the taunts, name-calling, and hatred alone. She may have felt abandoned, but a camera clicked and soon the world was watching. It would witness her courage and that of the other eight students. From the time Elizabeth first approached the National Guard, you knew this was a major confrontation between the governor and the federal government. Count said later about his famous photograph, she became a symbol for the Little Rock crisis. Courageous Civil Rights Leader In a white man's world, Daisy Gatson Bates, an African-American woman, was a rare leader. Bates and her husband, L.C. Bates, ran a newspaper that supported and chronicled the civil rights movement. In 1952, Bates became the president of the Arkansas chapter of the NAACP. Her role thrust her into the spotlight during segregation battles, including the confrontation in Little Rock. As an advisor to the Little Rock Nine, Bates let her home become the headquarters for civil rights leaders during the confrontation. She and her husband received countless threats and suffered numerous attacks because of their work. Pressure from segregationists made them lose advertising and forced them to close their newspaper, the Arkansas State Press, in 1959. Bates was known for showing remarkable courage. She once insisted that a white attorney call her Mrs. Bates instead of Daisy, an unthinkable challenge of white power. The Associated Press chose her as Woman of the Year in Education in 1957. She was also named one of the top ten newsmakers in the world. Bates' childhood was marked by tragedy. Three white men murdered her mother, and her father abandoned her. Friends of her family raised her. After the confrontation in Little Rock, Bates worked in Washington, D.C., ran community programs in Arkansas, wrote a book, and briefly revived the family newspaper. She died in 1999. Little Rock honored Bates' contributions by naming an elementary school after her, as well as a street that passes Little Rock Central High School. Arkansas celebrates a state holiday in her honor.